the, the reason we wanted to have this um, this conversation um, is that uh, on on um, in, in March the NIH uh, finally came up with a decision in the Extandi petition asking the uh, HHS, the Sec Secretary Becerra, to use the government's rights in patents on the cancer drug Extandi. Uh, to deal with the, with uh, uh, an issue of the prices for the drug being much higher in the United right. States than they are in other high income countries, and the basis of that petition was that it was not reasonable to charge U.S. residents significantly more for a drug uh, in the United States than they do in other high income countries. In our webpage at KIM, uh, 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 you know, like the, the webpage that has the um, that has the notice of the meeting, there's a, uh, a link to slides I was going to present here. But the first uh, slide in that particular group is a list of prices for Xtandi in several high-income countries. And if you can look at that data. Um, and I think Claire's trying to make it work right now. Okay, very good, Claire. Uh, you can see that the prices in the United States, um, uh, the, the, the columns, uh, like the, the main column you see, um, price per unit is price for one 40 milligram tab. And you need four cat, uh, tabs per day or 1,460 tabs per year of this particular drug. And the prices per unit um, uh, in, in, in most countries range from around, um, converted to US dollars, somewhere between 21 and uh, 30, $35 a pill. Uh, in the United States, uh, I have three prices down here, which were uh, uh, the most recent uh, Medicare Part D price we could find was for fiscal year 2021, and it's $112 per tablet. And then we have the uh, average wholesale price of 136.50 per tablet, which is comes out to $199,000 to uh, um, 199,290 per year for Xtandi in the US. And that would be compared to prices of between 30,000 and 45,000 in other high income countries. That's basically the core issue in the uh, in in the Xtandi dispute, which is before the U.S. government. Now, uh, if you could go down a little bit, Claire, to the second slide. The key provisions in the Bayh-Dole Act that were the basis of the Xtandi um, petition, where if you look at the um, uh, 35 U.S.C. 200 policy objective, at the very bottom of that, you'll see that one of the objectives. Uh, of the Bayh-Dole Act is to protect the public against both non-use or unreasonable use of inventions. And uh, the case uh, then really um, uh, focused uh, secondly on the definition of practical application. There's an obligation in the Bayh-Dole Act to bring a product to practical application. And that's defined in the statute in 35 USC 201. And, uh, 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 Claire, this is not, not actually the most recent version of the of the, uh, of the of the PDF file, so I don't know if you refresh your browser or not. But uh, 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 the the the, um, the key thing in the definition section is uh, uh, the last uh, seven words of the definition, which is that you are expected to make the product available to the public on reasonable terms. Now there, there's been uh, some question about whether or not uh, it, it, what 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 the Bayh-Dole Act intended by available to the public in reasonable terms, and there's been a fair amount of effort by people that want to keep the price to the public out of that equation by claiming that Senator uh, Dole and Senator Bay never intended the 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 words available to the public in reasonable terms to mean uh, a price to the public, and they try to say that that had to do with whether it was licensed on reasonable terms to drug companies. Mm -hmm. um, th thank you for that, Claire. 
uh, uh, what the part in blue is, is to remind people that uh, there, was, um, there was a four-year debate on what the Bayh-Dole Act would look like. And the first version of the Bayh-Dole Act introduced in 1978 by, by Bayh and Dole defined practical application to be available to public on reasonable terms from the subject inventor or assignee of the subject inventor. Or license. So I, I think that it was pretty clear uh, throughout the debate on the Bayh-Dole Act that available to the public really meant uh, the end consumers. Now, uh, separately, um, and we're happy to share it with people later if they're interested, we've looked at every single bill that was proposed during that four-year period on the same topic. And there's like uh, quite a few different ways that uh, practical application was defined in the different things. But one thing that, all, that, that, that was uh, the most prominent and what seemed to be the most inclusive was what ended up in the act available to the public in reasonable terms. The other two rights that the petitioners in the, in the Bayh-Dole Act um, brought up was the fact that uh, uh, the, the public also has rights in the patent through the government use right. In a case of uh, Extandi, which was invented at UCLA on government grants through the uh, Army and the NIH, the relevant statute would be 35 USC 2, um, um, 202 C4. Uh, and there's a similar thing if the NIH invents it uh, in, 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 in 209 of the statute. But in both those cases, the government always gets a worldwide uh, uh, royalty free right to use the subject on our behalf of the US government. Go right. to the next slide. Um, Claire. Uh, now the uh, 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 the NIH in March 31. I, I uh, in this slide it sort of pulls out some of the like I say you can get these slides from the uh, from the web page announcing the meeting. The, these these three slides and this this uh, uh, was the NIH basic response. And the short version is that the NIH instead of saying the obligation is to make a product available on reasonable terms. They really short, shorten it by just saying you have to make it available to the public. Like you can see part of it in that slide is, is bit bolded and you have like the dot, dot, dot available to and use by the public. That's not even really, um, uh, uh, that, that's actually a citation of of a decision that the NIH made in the past, but it's not really a quote of the statute itself. And uh, the dot, 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 they always like to leave out uh, uh, unreasonable terms. So this issue about whether it's reasonable terms or not is, is really has always been the base of the decision and the NIH has always ignored that. In March 23rd, 2003, uh, the petitioners in the case, uh, four, four cancer patients that have prostate cancer, one of whom is my brother, my older brother, a Vietnam vet, uh, who's, who's has, has stage four uh, prostate cancer. He's currently uh, uh, in a wheelchair and had a stroke not long ago. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the quotes here on the, on, the, on the slide are from things that were in uh, the appeal. And what they really keep coming back to is you can't really deny a petition on saying, that the product's not available to the public on reasonable terms by not addressing the unreasonable terms part of the petition or the statute. The other thing that was raised is that the NIH said that the clock had run out on the case because the patent's uh, life has, was, you know, because it, this case has been going on since, uh, in one form or another since 2016, that there's not enough time left in the pat to make a difference and because the, the, there will be appeals and it'll take a while to do the, the marching case. The patents expired in 2027. And uh, so uh, one thing the petitioners have raised, and I think some of the uh, people on the call will be able to speak to this, particularly, um, for, for example, um, I think Rob and uh, Professor um, Kesselheim will be able to speak to this. Uh, the the idea that the clock has run out is, is, is been, um, uh, it, 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 if the overarching was the only right the US government had would be more persuasive, but the US government already has a royalty free right in the patent. And they also have a separate right under, uh, uh, to use any, any invention that's, that's granted by the federal government under a different statute for uh, 28 USC 1498. 
And there's two generics that are ready to enter the market right now and have been for some time that have already received tentative approval from the FDA. So the, the government, that the petitioners want the government to do is to simultaneously pursue the march in and then use or threaten to use the royalty free right and the 1498 authority to make sure that the generics can enter the market on a timely basis. And if the government was to use its, its license, its, its 202 license and the 1498 thing together, they work well together because 1498 is a very broad authority. Usually the argument against using it is the cost of paying the patent owner. But in this case, that would be zero because the government has a royalty free right. And the biggest market in the planet for um, this particular drug is uh, the Medicare program. And uh, those are the end of my slides now. Uh, uh, one thing that's not in the slides, uh, and you can go back to the, uh, uh, Claire, you can go back to the, uh, uh, you can stop sharing the, the slides right now. Um, the, uh, and the same day that the NIH uh, rejected the petition, the government announced um, there'd be a government-wide review of marching rights and co-chaired co by Department of Commerce, which is, I think, thought to be probably uh, not very favorably disposed on these petitions, we'll have to see, and the NIH. And, that, and they're supposed to, uh, uh, there's a Federal Register notice, which is linked to in the uh, webpage notice uh, that'll be undergo. So one of the things we wanna talk about today are the use or non-use of the march in and the royalty free right safeguards in the Bayh-Dole Act. And the other thing is what's down the road in terms of the um, Biden administration review of the march in. We have four speakers today. We have Professor Aaron Kesselheim, who I'm gonna ask to uh, 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 start out by, uh, uh, I, I'm, well, I think first I'm gonna give Mark an opportunity because he has three slides to make an opening statement. And then I'm going to direct questions to, um, uh, Professor Kesselheim and uh, Rob Weissman, and uh, 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 also we're, we're uh, very happy to have uh, uh, J J Justin Hugh from um, Mendoza here from UAM, and, and he's also going to participate in the conversation. So, Mark, do you? Uh, yeah, uh, would you, you should be able to pull right these out. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Are you are you able yeah. to share your screen, even though I couldn't? Uh... Yep, yep, I'm right here. All right, so um, I want to make a little bit of a precursor statement. So I'm here, uh, Mark Sedam. Uh, I am the past chair of Autumn. I was the chair in 2020. And I just want to make it clear to everybody, because this is our institutional policy, that I'm, that I'm here talking as a representative of Autumn and as a subject matter expert in tech transfer, but not in the current position that I have, which is vice president of technology opportunities and ventures at uh, NYU and NYU Langone Health. So I just want to make that statement out front just so people know the perspective uh, through which I'm talking. So I wanna go back to what marching rights are and what they aren't. So there are four circumstances under Baidol when you could do marching. You know, and I'll let you read it. I think uh, probably half the people on this call have read this in great detail, but you know, there, there are four steps. So it's basically, we've licensed something to a third party who's not doing anything and is not making it available. And so, I, you know, I think Jamie in part, you know, I think accurately characterized the, the position that, that I will take, which is vital is really about access and nothing more. It's about the ability to commercialize, to promote the commercialization, to get ideas in the hands of third parties who can bring them to market because that's not what universities do. And basic research leads, it's why it's called research and not development. Basic research leads to innovation, which leads to discoveries. Those discoveries are translated to products and services by other people. And so the obligation under Baidol is A, to have a policy on how to do it, and then B, to get it in the hands of third parties under reasonable conditions. So what would be an example of a non-reasonable condition? It could be well, you'll have a license, but only if you buy the university president a yacht. You know, that would be an unreasonable position. But um, as long as we come up with a suitable business deal, the, the boundaries of buy dollar set, and then the license agreement makes sure that it's practically being developed. 
And uh, every university in the country has diligence milestones and financial diligence milestones to compel the licensee to develop product. And that really is, I think, for, for most purposes, what IDOL is there to do, to promote the commercialization of federally funded research. There are conditions two, three, and four about health and safety needs, which are not being satisfied. Um, and it, again, it doesn't say anything about pricing. Um, requirement for public use that says nothing about pricing. Um, and then, you know, the agreement is a license, you know, it's obtained or waived because the licensee is an exclusive right to use the subject invention. So, you know, at no point in Baidol is pricing discussed. And, and like Jamie said, you know, uh, there is this question of, you know, what was the intent? And unlike the Constitution, where we have to guess what Jefferson and Washington and Madison and Hamilton thought about, we have the words of Birch By and Bob Dole, who said expressly and repeatedly through their entire lives, this was not about pricing, that they thought about it, that people brought it up, and that it was drawn up specifically to not consider that, it, that it's about access and not cost. So we don't have to go too far from the place where this originated. Um, so I think it's probably not helpful to go back and say, I wonder what they meant, because we actually know what they meant, because it's on record, and they've both been on record for that. So, you know, what do the contractors have to do? They have to, oops, sorry, they have to comply with the administrative component. So, you know, we take title, we report to the government, we do all those things. The government does have that non-exclusive, irrevocable, paid-up license to the subject invention throughout the world. They have that. Uh, requirements for substantial manufacture and allowing the government to have these march-in rights. And again, the real intent of this was march-in was somebody has something amazing and is putting it on a shelf and is not developing it and it's not getting out to society. So um, in 50, almost 50 years of Baidol, uh, march-in has never been successfully enacted. And in fact, the Extandi case is the second time this was brought up. Um, it was brought up in the Trump administration and rejected. It was brought up in the Biden administration and rejected for substantively the same reasons. It's been brought up, I think this is the eighth petition for Marchin. It's been rejected every time under the same circumstance. So, you know, the position of Autumn is that the law is being applied appropriately, uh, consistently and regularly by NIH and, and by the government. Um, and so sometimes the question of whether it should or shouldn't be, I mean, this has been done repeatedly. Again, this is seven or eight, I don't remember exactly which. So, you know, kind of coming back and attempting to relitigate the same idea with the same concept and having the same answer all the time, you know, I think I think it's pretty clear what Bible is for and what it's not for. Now, Jamie brought up a lot of other things. We can talk about that. That's that'll be super fun to talk about. Um, but but beyond by Dole, I want to bring this up. Um, so we have the pre by Dole world and we have the post by Dole world. And, and some of the folks on this call know the details. But, you know, prior to 1980, uh, lots of inventions, relatively few of them were licensed. I think the numbers off the top of my head were something like 28,000 patents were held by the federal government and 4% or something like that were licensed. Um, but there really was not a substantive flow of new products and services coming out of NIH funded research. I'm not saying it's zero or it's substantively much less. Post Bible, we have 300 products and services that have reached the market, therapies, vaccines, diagnostics, all sorts of things that show kind of a pre and post world. And then so 12 years later or 10 years later, you have this issue with a CRADA and I, I, I remember this you know, where there was this question about, should we put pricing into CRADAs? And so we did, um, and CRADAs plummeted. The interest in CRADAs plummeted. And so they did this from 1990 to 1995, and the number of CRADAs was reduced. Now there's question about whether this was a counting error or, or whatever, but there actually was a report by NIH itself who surveyed people who did CRADAs. So for those of you on the call who don't know what a CRADA is, Collaborative Research and Development Agreement uh, by the federal government, um, the NIH itself went out and said, well, why did this not work? And the feedback from the people who refused to sign CRADAs were that the reasonable price application was a deterrent. And that they just simply said, well, look, if you're going to talk in this early stage about this early idea, and you're going to say, we're going to talk what your price has to be 12 years from now, they just didn't want any part of it. 
And so it, you know, this part is just kind of a failed business model. And then you remove it and it goes back up again. Now, again, you know, the, the lies to analyze some statistics, but I think, so I, I don't want to talk about necessarily the delta between numbers, but to, to really talk about what the NIH has published and is on its website is a report on why they think it happened. And their, their results were really clear that the feedback from the partners was this was not something they wanted to take on this obligation in the early stages, and it was a deterrent to innovation. So, you know, again, we, I think by the, the intent of Bible is pretty clear. And then this model of trying to apply pricing, even just in early stage collaborations, doesn't work either. So, you know, I just, I think in the end, the discussion of Bidol should be what Bidol is and isn't, which is access and not price. And then we can, you know, the larger discussion about everything else, I think is, is you know, fair to discuss, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the position that I think is, re is reasonably clear, both by the intent, by the, by the authors and by attempts to do this a different way, all of which, you know, kind of didn't work. And so we look today, the success of technology transfer, not funded by the government, by the by. Um, it, I think is pretty significant, and it's seen throughout the world as something good and something uh, a model to be copied, not not a model to be ignored. So I think you know we've all done a good job at universities. We take this stuff really seriously. We think heavily about how do we get these ideas out into the world to make the world a better place. That is the mandate that we all have, and I think that's the mandate that we're fulfilling. So I will stop that. Jamie, did you want me to go next? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just trying to, I'm, um, to uh, unmute myself. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yes, I, uh, Aaron uh, is a professor at, at Harvard Medical School, and I'm not sure how many appointments you have at Harvard, but you have several, I think. And uh, uh, so, uh, go ahead, Aaron. Well, I didn't prepare any slides, but I think it is important first to start with uh, with dismissing something that Mark said as, as being a, uh, a, a sort of a, a historical error, um, which is that the, this the graph that he put up um, is uh, you know combines two different types of create up pathways into a single graph. And if you look here, and what happened is is that unfortunately. Uh, Coincidentally, with the removal of the NIH pricing clause on CRADAs, NIH introduced a different CRADA pathway to encompass more agreements so that in that same year that that was removed, there was an opening for many more CRADAs to be signed. And so if you look here and you separate out the, the CRADAs to which the reasonable pricing clause applies, which are there in blue, and the craters to which the reasonable pricing clause were, were the craters to which the, uh, the was were created after it was ended, but was never subject to it before in white. You can see there that the removal of the reasonable pricing clause did not actually change anything in terms of the level of crater um, uh, willingness to enter into craters. And I would also point out that during those years in the box, by the way. Uh, in multiple different occasions, the, the reasonable pricing clause, which was not mandatory, was actually waived by the different parties or was contracted around. And so it was a very weak uh, reasonable pricing clause that was never actually implemented and in a, in a, in a full way and never really had any effect um, on, uh, on innovation and the willingness of, uh, of people to contract with the, um, with the NIH in any way. So uh, I think it's worthwhile to point that out first before um, I get into uh, talking about, I think what Jamie had wanted me to, uh, to talk about, which is this idea of, um, you know, the reason that we're not, we are not going to, uh, to get involved with uh, in invoking the by dole margin rights is because there is, um, uh, you know uh, that that the amount of time to implement it is is running out because we you know might expect um, some kind of generic competition coming down the road soon. Um, so, and I, I think that that of course is not part of the 
uh, statute. And uh, if, if we were in a situation like the kind Mark described where there was uh, a, an important new invention that was being kept on a shelf um, and, uh, and, you know, and yet the patents on that or market exclusivity on that invention was running out, I don't think that this, I don't think that the, uh, the, that possibility, you know, should be something that we would be invoking. We would be trying to get that product out to somebody who could uh, market it as, you know, efficiently as possible. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, I think it's also important to remember that pharmaceutical companies do everything in their power to try to delay uh, competition and generic entry for as long as possible. And so just because it looks like as we sit here today, that there's going to be a generic that's going to be marketed in nine months or 18 months or 24 months or whenever that is, it doesn't mean that that's actually going to happen, um, you know, because of, uh, you know, deals that brand name companies might form with the generic manufacturers or, uh, or, other, or other situations that might arise between now and then. And so the idea that there's some, uh, you know, possibility for competition down the road, I, I don't think that that's, uh, because we can't count on that, I don't think that that's a reason not to pursue uh, a, you know, a legitimate investigation into whether or not uh, margin rights are appropriate here. And um, so anyway, I, I, those, that's the, I'm happy to be part of the, you know, conversation here in the q and I, I think it's important to recognize that, um, you know, the uh, drug prices in the U.S. are uh, extremely high, far higher than they are in any other industrialized country because we uh, give pharmaceutical companies free reign to set prices at whatever level we want. And the extent of high prices now is so, so sort of uh, so much galactically different than it was in the late 1970s um, that I think it is reasonable to start equating pricing and access because, you know, you can't access a drug unless it is available at a fair price uh, that is consistent with the drug's value and is appropriate to the budget that, uh, that healthcare payers have for the product. And, you know, maybe that wasn't as true in, uh, in the late 1970s, but uh, it, is definitely, uh, it is definitely true today. And I think that that, uh, you know, should inform our perception of how to apply a statute that was uh, intended to ensure that the fruits of public investment, taxpayer investment, are um, readily available uh, to the to the to the public that invested them in the first place. Uh, th thank you very much, Aaron, uh, Professor uh, Kesselheim. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Rob Weissman if you uh, could share your thoughts on on where we stand right now in terms of the Bidwell safeguards, the extended case and the proposed uh, review by the Biden administration, the government wide review that they're proposing on March and rights. But Rob, by the way, I think he did his undergraduate thesis on, on the Bidwell Act. So he's followed this for a long time and he's, he's uh, familiar with, um, he's been involved in several of the cases, including providing a technical uh, support, for example, in the in the 2004 Abertonover uh, case. Rod? Thanks, Jamie. Um, that's true about um, my undergraduate thesis. So I, I, I spent a long time looking at the congressional record um, back in the 1980s. Uh, I, I wanted to sort of start where Aaron just stopped, which is to say the statute doesn't talk about access, but I don't think it's useful. It doesn't use that word. but I, in, in the way the way I look at things, the way I think most people would look at things, it does not make sense to talk about access without regard to price. You know, it is, it is not a, it is an unreasonable definition of access to say putting it on the market without regard to price. You can make that definition. I think it's an unreasonable definition from a policy point of view, and also just like a basic dictionary. Um, sensibility about it. I did want to say something about the this idea of what it, what Congress intended. I mean, the first thing you do when you would want to figure out what Congress intended is you actually look at the language that Congress used. And the language that Congress used is 
available to the public on reasonable terms. That's just pretty straightforward. Reasonable terms would suggest that as a matter of natural course, just regular understanding of English, that's going to include, yeah, whether it's available for sale per se, but also the terms of, by which it's available, and most obviously price. So if you just start with the words of the statute, it directs you to the outcome that says price should matter. And then you have to sort of do a lot of maneuvering to get around that, and I don't think it succeeds. But you can look at what Congress was saying at the time. When you look at congressional intent, you do, you take into account what the authors of a statute might have said, but it's not like it's what's in their head. It's what was in Congress's collective heads. Um, moreover, you would definitely want to discount the words of an author of, of the statute if that author subsequently was on the payroll of an affected industry, as was the case with Senator Bayh. But if you look at what Congress was talking about at the time, Bayh-Dole was a big shift from how uh, government funded inventions had been um, shared and made available to the public previously. And there was a lot of worry about it. There were years of debates, lots of congressional hearings about it, a variety of proposals made for how or whether to shift the licensing system at all. Um, there were ideas about that licenses should be restricted to, to limited fields of use or that there should be requirements for government recoupment of its investment. Those things weren't adopted. But throughout the congressional debate, there were consistent fears and concerns about making sure the government got some kind of payback for its investment, that the people, that the licensees did not obtain windfall profits. Windfall profits was a major consideration. And also that how the licensing would affect market competition um, with a lot of worry about the impact of exclusive licensing and, and buttressing monopoly power. So those are a set of considerations that really actually do elevate price as one of the underlying um, factors that you'd want to consider. Now, there's no question what Baidu actually was intended to do was facilitate um, exclusive licensing for the purpose of developing government funded inventions. That was the theory of it, no question. But there were worries about what would happen with that. There were safeguards that were built in a lot, you know, some proposed and not adopted and Marchin proposed and adopted to speak to the specific kind of worries that I just articulated. And it just made, it's, the, it is correct, as Mark said, of course, that NIH has rejected all of the, the you know, the, the small number of Marchin requests that have been presented to it based on the same misinterpretation of the statute and flawed public policy rationale. But that's not what should be, in my view, uh, or I think it, more importantly, in, in the view of, of what the statute says. So to me, the, you know, the appeal to HHS both makes a very compelling case on the merits and politically is important in saying, Okay, NIH is locked in on this for no for bad reasons. We want someone else to take a fresh look at this, who will look at the statute, take into account public health, not just the interests of licensees, and reach a determination that makes sense from a public policy perspective. So with eyes wide open about the likelihood of success of this appeal, I think it's super important and I'm very hopeful, uh, not that it will necessarily turn out the way I uh, would like, but that actually I hope that it in fact will, that there will be an honest look at this by the secretary uh, and a fresh look at it, because this was a very unfortunate outcome in this case. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, uh, so uh, now we'll hear, having just heard from the president of Public Citizen, we're gonna hear from Justin Mendoza, who's representing um, Universities Alive from uh, Central Medicine, and it was one of the uh, groups that had been involved in the petition for the March and request. Justin. Thank you, Jamie, and, and thanks everyone for being here. I um, just wanted to, uh, to jump right in and, and join the conversation. I'm Justin Mendoza, as Jamie said. I'm uh, the executive director for UAEM North America. And I apologize for background noise. I'm in a cafe in, in Berlin right now, uh, preparing for a conference over the weekend. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, to start by pointing out why UAEM, um, an organization that's dedicated to 
universities being a part of the solution to the access to medicines crisis is involved in this conversation to begin with. Um, and as Jamie alluded to earlier, uh, Xtandi was invented uh, and discovered on university labs, uh, in particular, the University of California, Los Angeles in 2005. Um, you know, researchers were actually able to, to discover that this could have an effect for prostate cancer. Um, and the university using mechanisms in the Bayh-Dole Act, um, the ability to patent and license to, of course, um, corporations that can bring it to the finish line uh, did set up a deal with Pfizer and Estellas Pharmaceuticals, actually, you know, uh, another uh, biotech along the way. Um, and by 2016, when the prices hit the prices that we were seeing earlier um, presented by Jamie, um, uh, UCLA went to an extreme level. Uh, they also defended uh, the the patent held on this drug in uh, in India uh, when a generic manufacturer was trying to develop an alternative affordable version of Xandi for uh, for one of the largest populations in need. And that's when UAM stepped into the picture. We we started engaging with the university, doing our bread and butter work, raising this issue on campus, talking with cancer survivors, patients, and others. Uh, to to really make the story heard, understand the university's role. And I'm excited to say that the university stepped up. Uh, the university's technology transfer office, working with us, working with the medicines patent pool and a number of other folks, um, addressed the issues, at least where it affects uh, low and income, low and middle income countries for future medications invented and in, or discovered on UCLA's campus using an affordable access plan of licensing. Now, the reason I raised this is because it was novel. It was the first time we'd seen a US-based university actually focus on an actionable policy proposal uh, that puts affordability right out there front and center in their licensing policies. And the reason I raised that is because in the backdrop of Bayh-Dole not having access provisions or affordability provisions, as we were just discussing, there, there are kind of two camps on that, right? Um, well, UAM, we're not the organization that's experts on Bayh-Dole, though I also wrote my master's thesis on, on the act, so I, I do understand it from a, a similar perspective. Um, but the uh, what UAM's perspective is, is that university licensing should take into uh, account the public interest and in, in public access. Um, and I raised that because in 2007, um, AUTM released the Stanford Nine Points, or as it's called, the Nine Points to Consider in University Licensing. And the reason it's relevant is because if the government isn't supposed to, through the Bayh-Dole Act, use its margin rights provisions to uh, address affordability, then surely universities with public funding and public interest in their mission statements should be uh, enforcing and looking at affordability and access. However, um, a brand new assessment that just came out this week from Professor Jorge Contreras shows us that over 15 years of um, the nine points to consider uh, being implemented, not a single provision in the nine points, including ones about commercialization, have actually been effective and changed university licensing practices at all, uh, which, which begs the question, why do they exist? as nine points to consider? Um, and why do 118 universities, including the University of California, sign on to these um, before uh, then issuing uh, licenses that then leave us with no other recourse but to file uh, these types of petitions to try to uh, truly get back to the core issue around Bayh-Dole and who actually has the rights to march in and do something about this work. I'll put a link to that article in because I think it's truly telling in terms of um, the kind of empty approaches that we've seen um, from uh, large uh, technology management um, uh, organizations and others over the years, and truly shows us that, that we do need uh, to see Congress and the NIH interpret uh, the Bayh-Dole Act correctly and, and be able to actually address these things from a government perspective, uh, because without going university by university, we're certainly not going to see it from uh, the university level. You're on mute, Jamie. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to, uh, at this point, uh, drill down on some of the, the, the key issues in the debate and have some back and forth with the panelists and, uh, and, and of course, people in the 
are, are, are joining by Zoom can also post questions in the in the chat. But the first thing, uh, Claire, could you put up this uh, uh, the slide on the crater data? Uh, Aaron already had a slide, uh, so this is redundant from what Aaron had up. But I just wanted to uh, uh, focus people a little bit more attention on 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 what happened in terms of the crater data, because this was this has long been sort of out there as an argument against the reasonable pricing obligations that the NIH could be involved in. Uh, if you look at the period from 1989 to 1996, where the reasonable pricing clause was in effect, uh, or I think it started around 19, you know, even, even before that, it was, uh, 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 there was this jump as, as uh, Professor Kesselheim mentioned, in 1996, where this new category of uh, material craters was added to the mix. And uh, so uh, you had, uh, uh, you know, this insanely high number of uh, material craters that were, came onto the thing. And it looked like if you got rid of the reasonable pricing clause, if you mixed up the two categories, if you mixed up just the standard craters and the material craters, it looked like the, the elimination of the reasonable pricing clause was just leading to an explosion of new collaboration. Uh, but this was really an anomaly. This was just like uh, something that was basically a materials transfer agreement. Uh, kind of an elaborate version of that was being kind of uh, uh, added into something that was a much different instrument, the standard crater. The standard craters were relatively level and they actually went down by 2002, they were down to, um, in, in, in the low 20s, all these collaborations went down, but in, you know, there was a, uh, a, a really a, a big, you know, an actual decline over after the reasonable pricing clause was eliminated. And I don't think you could really say that the elimination of the reasonable pricing clause led to a decline in private sector investment. I, I, I just think there were so many other things that were going on at that time in terms of the NIH policies itself toward the credit agreements and what was happening in capital markets. Uh, so I, 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 I just, I just think it's really unfortunate that people still bring up uh, the the data that combines the the standard crater with the material crater as if that's any evidence that the reasonable pricing clause discouraged collaboration. You can get, uh, you can take that slide down and stop sharing uh, at this point. The second thing I wanted to mention is that it's not like Bai and Dole were always. Uh, vocal about uh, saying what uh, the, uh, the the public interest safeguards were. It was only in uh, uh, it was only when Mickey Davis and Peter Arnault published an article about uh, available to the public in reasonable terms what it meant in in uh, uh, after two thousand that you began to see by and Dole speak out on this issue. And at that time, both of them were working as lobbyists representing right owners. Bob Dole was on television as a spokesperson for Pfizer at that time, uh, uh, selling Viagra. And uh, 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 before that, uh, by in 1997, had been actually a, a petitioner for the very first uh, marching case. And in the marching case, I, I shared uh, one quote in, in the chat. He argued that, uh, that, that one of the problems with what happened in the self growth thing was it was going to lead to high prices for consumer. And he thought the buy dole actually have regulations to prevent that from happening. The context was licensing, but he brought up the effect of the prices on the consumers is one of the reasons why the government had to intervene. So buy dole, when he represented self growth, had one opinion about the buy dole act on prices. And when he worked for a firm that represented Abbott, which was in the middle of a case in the Ratonover case, he took a different position. Now, uh, also by later on, he submitted a, uh, an amicus brief in a, in a case involving uh, Stanford University about what the Baidol uh, Act meant in terms of whether you assign ownership to invention to a university or inventor. And he, he, he did the same thing. He said, well, like I'm, I'm by the Baidol Act and I can tell you what the Baidol Act meant to do and this blah, 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 blah. The Supreme Court not only rejected his view and took a position completely contrary to the position he took in the case, but they didn't even bother to cite his amicus brief in the Supreme Court's decision. So I think Rob's interpretation that the plain language is really the accepted idea that you don't look 20 years down the road when somebody's working as a lobbyist, two people that voted on an act in an entire Congress 
what it meant and also ignoring the first version of the bill they introduced in 1998 which clearly made it made it clear that available to the public did not have to do with licensing because the first version they introduced said that available to the public had to be from the licensee um, uh, and, and it wasn't about the licensee getting reasonable terms it wasn't certainly about uh, the university president getting a yacht or anything like that uh, at the time um, and but Jamie, um, if you bring up if you bring up the way legislation goes through in every version of every law that's ever been created and look for things that somebody said that disagreed, you could interpret anything to mean anything. And well, that's and, why they you know that, while I'm listening why, to the arguments of everybody else, I mean one of the, the things I hope I'm bringing to the panel here is not an academic approach. Ironically, I'm going to say this in a way that's probably never been said before. Not an academic approach of I've read the things and I think it should mean this, not what it actually means. But as somebody who's a practitioner of this and somebody who's on the ground and can tell you that there are active discussions every day with licensees about the existing regulations of Baidol and what it means to commercialize. And so and I don't think it's really, I mean, the ad hominem on buy and dull is not helpful. It's not ad and hominem. I think it's the, it's well, we should reasonably. It's, it's factual. It's, it's, you're it's, saying 20 years later, they took money from the gut. Like that doesn't really help. That's a anymore. fact. Going back to. It's a fact. Okay, great. But Slow, what's the, but the, the law slogan, was. You're, you said this is what this is what their view is of the statute. Right. My view is look right. at the words in the statute, which I think are completely clear. Don't say access. You read access, access into and, it. Fine. And, but your and point was it, look, your point. Well, your it, point was to look at what buy and dole say. OK, if you want to look at what buy and dole say, first of all, that's not how you do congressional intent. But fine. Look what they say. You must take into account their conflicts. How could you possibly not do that? What academic institution later. would not require disclosure of the conflicts of the speaking party? None. You could also look at what they yeah, said during the debate, and, and it was different. Uh, what they what they said in the debate, what by what by said in the debate was very different. It was sort of laid out in the in the briefing of the uh, the NIST made this proposed regulation, as you know, Mark, back in the beginning of the Biden, the Biden administration. It came out at the end of the Trump administration to get rid of prices on marching. There were eighty thousand comments, but there were also a lot of technical briefs, walking people through the legislative history, and. What they were saying in the in the in, in, in twenty years after the act was different than what they said during the debates uh, on the act itself. Uh, but the plain I language, I'm just looking at it from not what we want it to be, but what it is. And when eight times the same argument comes up, and eight times it's rejected, and the government itself is saying this is what it means. Oh, I don't disagree. I think it's, with you. I think it's pretty right. clear. Yeah, they're very, they're very clear, but we ever, everybody knows what it means. We can want it to mean something different. I don't, because I, I think it's very successful. But wanting it to be different doesn't mean it is different. Well, Mark, why is it when the NIH makes these decisions again and again and again, they start the, they quote the part of the statute that says available to the public, and they don't say the last part, which is on reasonable terms. Why are they allergic to those terms on reasonable terms? Why doesn't the um, Biden administration say, they're charging Americans two hundred thousand dollars in the United States for a product that costs thirty to forty-five thousand everywhere else on the planet in other high-income countries is reasonable terms. Why don't they own that? Instead, they say no. They they won't even acknowledge that the statute has those unreasonable terms in there. And what terms does the public care about? You think the the public is like really concerned that the president of the university is going to a yacht? I don't really think that's really what reasonable terms even I, I think they don't bring it up because it's clear that Baidol is about access and not price. I mean, it's clear. Well, That's why what, they don't what bring is, it is, up. What, and it's what clear is, that, that- I'm not sure why, I'm not sure why it's clear, or, 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 or maybe a different way to say it is, yeah, it is clear that that is what, absolutely, that was the whole purpose of Baidol. But Marchin is a, is a safeguard element of it designed to speak to <laughs> the, designed to speak to the concerns that were raised at the time that, persist today and why would so you can't there so you can't say what's well, the safe at the time we're safe, not it's a safeguard that should be used only to advance the the overarching objective that's not what a safeguard is the, the the concern at the time was that things weren't getting developed and the reason that the margin positions haven't been successful is because things were developed so you know what the quickest you know we're all arguing about things after it's all well i'm not about after it happens and once it reaches the market, what happens then? 
if it doesn't ever reach the market, that's the real problem. And you're looking from a pre-world with very limited successful therapeutics developed out of federal funding. So Mark, you're, 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 sorry, with you're, you're, very you're, successful. So, so, so Mark, are, are you I, saying, I just like, I don't get it. Mark, are you saying available to the public on reasonable terms means available to the public on any terms? I'm saying that the by goal is about making sure that the developers of intellectual property, I'm quoting the statute. result of federal I'm research. A, I'm quoting no, the statute. I, I, that's I'm not, exactly I'm, what I'm this is not. This is not like esoteric. I mean, you're a lawyer. The statute says, and the case is about. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a recovering biochemist. Oh, okay. My, my apologies. The statute says, available to the public on reasonable terms. The case is about that. The appeal is about that. The NIST thing that had 80,000 comments was about these three words, available to the public on reasonable terms. The on reasonable terms is the thing that the NIH just will not own up to as part of the statute. Now, the NIH does not have to deal with on reasonable terms. They can ignore it. The, you know, the Bayh-Dole Act doesn't require them to use the safeguards. But to argue that they don't have the authority to use the safeguards is just not honest. They have the authority. They have the royalty free right. They have the margin right. They have two different ways that they can address this issue and they don't do either one, not because they can't, but because they're okay with charging Americans six times as much, three times as much, five times as much in America than they do in Germany or Japan or Canada or other high income countries for a product invented on a government grant. They, they have the right to ignore the safeguards but they don't really have, I think, uh, the ethical ability to claim that those safeguards don't exist. Aaron, I, I mean, you- I mean, I guess I'm just going back to the discussion of Baidol, which is what is it for and what is it not for? And it's about making sure those, those ideas get into the hands of somebody who could develop them and reaching the market is part of what everybody wants to happen. We all want the same thing. We all want life-saving therapies to reach the market and to have people use them. And I think that's, that's where Bidol stops. The rest of the stuff that everybody's talking about, about price and, and again, looking backwards and saying, let's reinterpret what things say. I just, Re uh, you know, I just think they're, the market answers those questions. The market does not interpret the statute. That can't be. And, um, I, you know, on the policy side. No, I'm saying the market addresses the other issues. I'm not talking, I'm saying the market addresses the market, things but, like pricing. The market, well, let me, you're saying, well, this gets to the point that Jamie's saying, I, mean, I don't think it's true that placing it on the market makes it accessible to people, right? The, the, the price has to be a component in, in availability and accessibility. But also, also on reasonable terms. I mean, it, it isn't just available to the public. The statute says it has to be available to the public on reasonable terms. I mean, that's the statute. That's what the case is about, is what constitutes on reasonable terms. By the way, on the collaboration, uh, Claire has, has, has pulled together cases where during COVID, the, U, the US put re, um, a reference pricing clauses in COVID contracts. One of them was by Pfizer. Pfizer is half owner in Extandi. Pfizer signed a most favored nation cl cl pricing clause for Paxivid, which gives the US, based on seven high income countries, the best price among the seven countries. That is exactly, or that's even more aggressive than what the cancer patients were asking for in the Xtandi case. Pfizer signed that contract, and not only is that an important drug, it's probably the most profitable drug in, in terms of one year revenue in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. So it's a, you know, it's a pretty significant drug. Um, uh, it's not like people won't sign these contracts if they're offered the contracts. They just, they're just never asked to sign the contract. Aaron, you've been kind of quiet, um, I guess. Nope, I, I, uh, I'm happy to jump in with, uh, with anything. I think, I, again, I, I put this in the chat, but uh, I think there is also evidence in the literature that uh, actually NIH related inventions discoveries were being uh developed and licensed before by dole 
Uh, there were a, a lot of government patents that weren't being developed, but most of those were NASA patents and were uh, patents that that uh, contractors had already passed on. So they you know maybe didn't have a lot of value to them. So you know there was a lot of technology transfer that went on uh, before Baidol at Baidol formalized. And uh, obviously there was a substantial increase in the role of publicly funded research and government uh, and government development after that, in part because of the, uh, you know, the uh, substantial number of, of discoveries that opened up different areas of biochemistry in, uh, in, the, in the 1980s. And the fact that over the course of the intervening three decades, most large pharmaceutical companies have actually turned away from doing primary research and uh, and relied to a greater degree on the publicly funded science that that leads to the discovery of the of the um, you know types of products that you know lead to important transformative discoveries which is why um, it becomes even more relevant today to think about uh, ensuring that the that the Bayh-Dole Act you know remains uh, uh, you know a, a protector of, of uh, of reasonable access. Uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, policy objective statement in the Bayh-Dole Act, they refer to protect the public from either non-use, which is what Mark is talking about, or unreasonable use of patented inventions. So there's a, really the question is whether or not there's a difference between non-use and, re and, and a reasonable use is relevant. I mean, there's whether or not the NIH is focused on non-use is the only really serious concern and that unreasonable use is sort of dropped off the thing because it, it's, it's opposed by, actually it's opposed by technology managers as well as universities, as well as by drug companies. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of a coalition between the universities, I think, and the drug companies on this issue that both are kind of opposing um, any, any prices, uh, price controls attached to a government funded technology. Mark, I think your, your position is that is that that makes it harder to license, right? If there's a, uh, a pricing condition, affordable pricing condition attached to a contract, right? Um, I think it's one reason. I and mean, the, the other thing for everybody who doesn't kind of like this isn't your life, right? Like, <laughs> like some of us on the call is, you know, we often have one licensee, right? There aren't multiple licensees. I wish people would fight over our technology, but they don't because there's a billion plus dollars of development, especially if you're talking about therapeutics. And I've seen it in my personal negotiation, whether it was here or whether in my current position, not my current position, but in previous stops at different places. Bidol itself is seen in, in commercialization as, hey, what is this thing? We have to overcome it. What does it mean? And we often find ourselves describing, you know, look, here's what it is. As long as you're developing a product and it reaches the market, nobody has a problem with it. So it is, it is in and of itself a little bit of a headwind on the commercialization of federally funded research. And so adding something that says, please invest $1.2 billion. And oh, by the way, somebody later on will decide what they think it might be is, you know, everybody gets to make a decision. If people decide to invest or not invest in technology as they see fit, am I saying it's a reason why somebody might say, hmm, well, I could do this or I could not have that somewhere else. I certainly think it's something that people think about because it's something they tell us about. Well, so I mean, that's an example of the drug doesn't get developed because at the very first stage, somebody says, no, thank you. And, this, and that's the real risk here. Well, it, it is a risk. Uh, it's also uh, uh, an assertion about the amount of money that is spent uh, to bring it from the university uh, to the market. Do you, do you agree that it would be good to have more transparency of what actual outlays are once you get licensed from a university or the NIH to get it to the market? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Well, for example, the NIH- Transparency of what uh, uh, federal funding is public. So, so yeah, the federal funding is, but you, you mentioned the billion dollars, you're not talking about federal funding, you're, talking, you're, you're making an assertion about private sector investment. So, Estellas, the Japanese. I'm just company. using the Tufts study. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I know what you're using. Yeah, or, and it's it, probably bigger than the number that you get. But like I said, so UCLA has uh, uh, Extandi, an invention. They license to private companies. 
And then that eventually ends up approved by the FDA or the NIH licenses a CAR T technology to Gilead and it, it ends up in the market. So do we, should we always ask this, this consultant to the drug companies um, from Tufts University uh, what was involved or should we just have some actual data, some real evidence about what the, the cost is? I mean, so that's my question is like, is it reasonable to have actual data on what was actually invested to bring a thing from a licensed thing from a public sector institution to the market? And I'll tell you right I, now. I don't we, think that has anything to do with my doll. I mean, well, you mentioned that's you mentioned, a different. Well, that's a different you question. mentioned you mentioned the one point two billion dollar investment. So you seem to think that that's an important fact. And 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 I'm I'm questioning whether or not that's an actual fact. Like we did a a FOIA request in the Xtani case, and uh, uh, of institutions that did the clinical trials on Xtani. And we were surprised that the, the per patient cost of the, of the CROs were coming in at under $20,000 a patient. You don't get to a billion dollars very fast with those kind of CRO costs. CRO costs not the only thing, but it does give you an idea where you can start when you have a product that has uh, 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 you know, a, a certain number of patients in the trials. So you know, most cancer drugs uh, have, have relatively small trials these days compared to say a heart disease drug or something like that. Um, anyway, it's just a question about whether or not, uh, when, when we ask uh, uh, the NIH to put in licenses that a requirement that they disclose what they spend uh, on clinical trials to bring things to the market, they, they, they say no, they just say, they just say they can't do that. Uh, 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 because of the, you know, they point to a provision which was amended in the Bylaw Act uh, uh, some years ago to claim that they don't have the discretion to uh, to make any of that data public from the company. But, but you know, we, I mean, I guess, I guess to 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 answer your question, Jamie, I think when you, if you want to draw a straight line from success all the way to the first test tube, surely that number is smaller than the total effort put in to develop drugs. And, and, and regardless of what the number is, the total numbers in research certainly are much, much smaller than the total numbers put after invest, you know, after the investment. That's all I'm saying is, well, you know, I don't know whether it's relevant or not. It's really has nothing to do with Bidol. That's a separate, well, that's the, a separate well, the, issue. I'm just acknowledging that the hurdles that we have to commercializing are significant and adding additional hurdles when the probability of success is low uh, will affect the ability for the United States and the rest of the world to get these life-saving drugs that we're all discussing after they've already been successful. So is the, only, is the only solution to allow them to charge five or six times more in the United States than ever else on the planet, that anything else short of that will kill the goose or something like that? Yeah, I think it's beyond the scope of my bill. I, can I just say um, two things? I mean, I, I think um, there's a way in which it's beyond the scope because you're right, it really comes down to what the law is. And we've had an exchange about that, but we obviously the, the policy implications are, are worth talking about. And you, know, you, you reasonably have taken the conversation there. It seems to me two things. One, it's, it has to be to some extent true what you're saying. It's you're going to get more commercialization as long as you're using the exclusive model. You're going to use more commercialization the less, the fewer restrictions you put on the on the licensee. But that's also an argument, by the way, for universities abandoning their royalty claims because that would be a diminution in the in the expected return of the licensee and, and the universities. I, I I don't recall doing that. And the other point is. If you take the language seriously about um, reasonable terms, then I think you then you can have an argument about reasonable terms are. Like it's not it's not necessarily the case. It, it may I mean there's an argument that actually making the U.S. pay more is reasonable because that's just how it works out. And eventually, you know, there's got to be some fair return to the companies. And if Japan has price controls. Doesn't mean that that that, that should be imposed on. Um, Pfizer or Estellas in the United States. Like that's an argument to be had, but I, I don't, it, it seems just way too much to me to say, well, no, reasonable terms means nothing at all. 
Like that, and and and, that, and in that sense, to me, actually, the policy the policy arguments then do come back in the debate. And okay, let's figure out what reasonable terms are. But to say that they to, to read it out of the statute or the reasonable terms has nothing to do with price. I don't see how that makes sense as a matter of logic and the, even including the policy direction you're taking it and certainly not in the context of what the statute itself actually says. I would, I would, I would love to see the NIH uh, uh, read the whole statute and then say uh, the price of Xtiandi being three to five times, three to six times higher in the US than in all other high income countries is reasonable for the following reasons and own it. But you know they don't do that. They they just act like that part of the statute just like didn't exist, right? They might point to a letter to the editor from uh, Bob Dole and 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 and, and uh, Birch by uh, twenty years ago and say, well, these guys wrote a letter to the editor and that sort of settled the issue for us. I mean, that's sort of weak. I mean, what 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 they need to do is to sort of this is what the statute says, and we think this is reasonable terms, and. I don't think it's reasonable terms. I don't think, and, and you know what? When, the, when these politicians run for office, they all claim it's not reasonable terms. I mean, you know, when, 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 Bi when Biden makes speeches about drug pricing, he always complains about Americans paying more and things like that. It's a hard case to make that you're gonna roll back the prices for every, every drug uh, because it might have a negative effect on in innovation. But when you start with a drug that's invented on a, on a university, on a government grant, it seems to be that it, that's got to be your strongest case for saying Americans shouldn't pay more than then it would, you know, it, it would be in general. It seems like actually, if you were aggressive, you'd say Americans should pay less than everyone else. I mean, it's kind of really modest to say we should just pay the same amount if we paid for the R and D at the, at, 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 at the early stage of the R and D, which is the most, as you know, the most risky part of, part of the development process. Um, but I think as a, as a, as a pragmatic approach at the beginning. So let's, let's talk about like, we're all talking about, well, you're now talking about the end and I'm sort of talking about the beginning is from a pragmatist point of view, I mean, in an early stage license, let's say, you know, we have a, a, an excellent test tube, or as I, I frequently say, there are lots of cancer-free mice, not as many cancer-free humans, right? So something early promising looks great. The reasonable terms as we always looked at it, at, uh, in, interpreted is between us and the licensee, not, we're not, at the point of the end user because the end user is a decade plus away and nobody would have the foggiest idea what any of this would cost. So really, again, I think this just reinforces the concept that that reasonable term as written and as interpreted eight plus times over is really between the license owner, which is, or the, the intellectual property owner, which is the, in this our discussion, the universities and the person taking it forward. It would be counterproductive to, to have any discussion about of the hundreds of licensees, thousands of licensees do every year to say, what should the price of this thing be later on? Which again, I think just reinforces the concept that this is really about the front end of the economic, or, uh, not the economic, the innovation engine and not the back end. And I just think there are better, I think there, there are different ways to approach the economics of drugs. It's just, I just think it's just a mis misapplication of Bible as written, as interpreted, and as executed. Well, isn't it self-serving for the university? It just doesn't that? work. It like lock us up, and nothing would happen. Mar Mark, isn't it, isn't it self-serving for the uh, the universities to claim that as long as you can enter in a license with a drug company, you satisfied available to the public on reasonable terms part of the statute? I mean, it's sort of it's good for your endowment, but. Is that really a reasonable interpretation of what available to the public on reasonable terms actually means in the statute? I know that it may be what you I mean, want I don't, to I say, don't think but... it's self-serving. I think the objective is to get it into the hands of somebody who can develop it into something useful. If, if we knew at the very beginning, this was it, the objective you know, is there might be a out, different model to the thing. The, the objective is spelled out. I just don't see how that can be a reasonable view, Mark, of, of, of what the terms of the statute mean apart from it's a the reasonable use modifies available to the public, but why would you need a safeguard to suggest reasonable terms between a willing seller and a willing buyer? I mean, what else would you have? What, what else, what, I mean, you, you, the idea that you have to come up with these like pretty extreme examples that, well, 
It's an anti-corruption measure to intend to not provide yachts to residents. Like that's just not reasonable. That's not a reasonable interpretation of what that could mean in the statute. And there's no reason for the language to be there to speak to the issues you're talking about. We we even had a case. Yeah, I, guess I, I guess case. I guess I yeah. I, I let, let Mark just give you an example. The Vertonover case. There was two issues. One, should the price have gone up? Uh, you know, 500% in the U.S. Uh, for uh, this HIV drug in one day. Uh, and the second issue was whether or not uh, it was reasonable for them to refuse to license uh, ritonavir to be co-formulated with Bristol-Myers drug for HIV, because uh, fixed dose combinations are an important uh, uh, factor in treating HIV. And so, and, 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 the, and the NIH, and, and, and Abbott had this thing where like, uh, the price, the price increase uh, uh, did not apply to their co-formulated product, but it would reply, it would apply to if someone else used ritonavir in their co-formulated. I mean, I, I'm not explaining it very well, but basically Abbott had a, uh, a triple therapy product and uh, Bristol-Myers had one that required the, 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 the Abbott ritonavir drug which was done by on a government grant to be combined with with their drug for it to work, and so uh, they did a price increase designed to prevent people from buying the the Bristol Myers drug, which a lot of AIDS patients thought was the better combination because it was just sort of priced out of the market, and they thought the insurance companies would stick then and protect the Abbott market share. Well, even in that case, the NIH. Uh, uh, refused to basically look at whether that was reasonable or unreasonable, even though it was not like ultimately a pricing, it was kind of a, I mean, prices were involved, but it was, it was like this sort of market segmentation designed to protect their drug versus uh, uh, the Bristol-Myers drug. Even in that case, the NIH was like, hey, whatever you do, it's like, uh, you know, your business, you just go out there and maximize your profits however you want, we don't really care. The NIH is really super hands-off in these cases. Uh, and it, 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 it's just, it just, it, it's astounding that, uh, uh, you know, you see like President Clinton, I'm the president, President Trump got elected with like, I'm going to like make sure Americans, he had an executive order, should not pay more than other high income countries for Medicare drugs. And then he rejected the Xandy case, even though that's primarily a Medicare drug. And uh, the price was like super discriminatory toward Americans. Joe Biden runs for office on the idea that Americans are not going to pay more. He also, you know, hands it back to the NIH. The NIH is never going to approve one of these things uh, left to their own devices. I mean, they hate these marching requests. You're right, Mark. They, 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 they you know, they, they're trying to reject them all. That's for sure. There was one case, on the other hand, that did go the other way a bit, and that was the cisplatin case uh, uh, in the early days of the, of the Bayh-Dole Act. Uh, where where the 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 uh, uh, the NIH did sort of step in and require them to lower a price and fund some independent R and D, but that was not really a marching case. It was just it was just a, a one of those early examples when the NIH used to take its responsibility a bit more seriously on this reasonable terms thing. Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry uh, uh, for. Uh, uh, you know, if that if that is uh, a bit off topic. Um, well, I, I think we're going to probably wind this up pretty soon. This is, I, I told everyone that they'd have to be participating through three o'clock. And Mark's been a super good sport for <laughs> taking on like four people in this conversation. He knew what he was getting into. And, and I did. <laughs> and, and we're really, you know, I, I, I want to tell people that we really tried hard to get bio to participate. And uh, uh, Pat Pat uh, Kilbride at the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and I'm hopeful going forward that we can have uh, them also participate. Um, yeah, but I really am thankful for Autumn for not only they really made an effort to get Mark here because they tried to get two other people that had conflicts, and 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 and, and so they really were committed to engaging in the conversation, and that's that's really greatly appreciated, at least by us. And I'd like to thank Mark very much for. His contributions here. I'd like, to, I'd like to give 
the different panel members uh, an opportunity to, to say some closing comments, maybe starting with Justin, going through Aaron, and then and then Rob, and then Mark. Uh, Justin, would you like to say some closing comments? Yeah, absolutely. And um, not a not a ton to add. I think uh, this group's been very thorough, which is great. Um, just I forgot to mention this before in my opening comments, but uh, from UAM's perspective, you know, jumping in as a as a signatory on these petitions is not a is not a light task of uh, of deciding. Oh yes, we should look so far upstream to look at the Bayh-Dole Act uh, when we normally are really trying to tinker around the licensing space um, specifically. But you know, in the case of Extandi, in the case of uh, of these drugs where the cost has been so disproportionate, uh, the price rather has been so disproportionate. Um, you know, we think it's it's critical to uh, to look to where statute can work in the public interest. And so I'm uh, just excited or not excited. I'm happy that we're having this discussion. I think the, the fundamental questions here are around interpretation are, are the questions. But I, I think, uh, you know, from our perspective, it's it's clear as day that we should be able to look at reasonable um, use and reasonable terms here for uh, for pricing as well. Uh, Aaron, Professor Kesselheim from Harvard. So uh, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, really, uh, you know, interesting and educational uh, last uh, hour and 15 minutes. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm glad to be part of these conversations. Uh, you know, the research group that I run here at uh, the Brigham, which is called Portal, or the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law, we we do a lot of uh, a lot of work in this area. And I, the slide that I showed related to that um, was a was was one of the articles that we published. And you know, I think that that you know we're gonna we're gonna continue to do work in this area to try to understand um, you know the best ways of trying to make the um, you know, the Bayh-Dole Act work, you know, as effectively and efficiently as possible for uh, for patients, because the uh, you know the role that government funding plays in in the pharmaceutical sector is uh, is is fundamental and uh, extremely important, and um, you know the the um, and, and you know and I think that the Bayh-Dole Act uh, is uh, is a part of that process too. So. Um, you know, because of because it is it is such an important part of the uh, of this uh, uh, you know of our of our healthcare sector. Um, I think it 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 is you know necessary to have these kinds of conversations and to um, you know push the issues that uh, that that everybody on this panel has been talking about. So you know, thanks for that, uh, Rod. Well, Aaron, I wanted to say, I thought that was pretty impressive that you were able to pull up that slide without any prior notice and it's like at your fingertips. Like that's, I, you know, as you know, I'm a big fan of your work and I know your, your capacities, but that was like, wow, you just, that's, that's quite a library you've got. Uh, and I want to thank Justin also for, for all the work and I want to relate that to the next comment, which is to say, um, you know, Mark, I think that, um, I haven't been into space as much recently, but I've been around it for forever. And what I know is that you and, and your colleagues, um, well, first of all, you're, you're strangely powerful in this debate. Um, actually more powerful, I believe, than the, than the drug companies. But um, that, you know, and I think it's been really clear in your presentation, but in everybody I've ever met from, um, these comparable jobs, you completely believe in what you're doing um, and are, are, are trying to advance both university objectives, which I think is great. Um, and and the sort of, and you know, as you as you articulate the commercialization objectives, which is to serve the public interest by making things available. Um, so it's I think your motives are all um, you know, with the angels. I do hope because of your position of power that you can also, and this is where I appreciate what Justin and, and folks at UAM have done, also think more deeply about the reality of affordability and its impact on access. You just, and you know, I think there's certain things that to, you know, from where I sit seem fairly obvious that I do not think are obvious to you, which doesn't mean that I'm right. 
but I just hope that you can increasingly take that perspective into account. I do not believe that it would end or even materially affect licensing arrangements, even you know, with the current system we have, if there were modest limitations on how rich drug companies can get, how much they can um, overcharge U.S. consumers. Um, and I think it would make a really big difference in, in both the taxpayers, but even more importantly to patients if we had more affordability, both in the United States and, and around the world. Um, and the last thing I want to say is just to echo what Jamie said, and, and really appreciate you coming on and uh, really articulating powerfully the perspective that you're advancing and also sort of sticking with it and um, maintaining good humor with our uh, ad hominem attacks against former senators. Well, I mean, this is, this is Kevlar, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I'll, so I'll, I'll kind of wrap up and I think, no, so I appreciate it. First of all, we appreciate, we always appreciate being invited. I mean, I don't think anyone was surprised by the perspective um, that I shared, that, that is, is my personal belief, but also, you know, a long held position by the association. And, and, you know, the one thing we all have in common is we want drugs to reach the market first. That's the, mo that the most important thing to solve is getting things that actually work into humanity to make, to improve public health. Without that, this argument doesn't exist because there's nothing to argue over. And so, you know, the thing I guess I want to leave everybody with is nothing is perfect, but I do think the existing process works pretty well to get drugs into development. And really in the end, I think that that access point and that discussion about what the purpose of Vidol is, is really about facilitating the transfer of technology from federally funded research into the hands of people that will take it the rest of the way to get it to market. There's a lot of things that are going to change that over the coming years that, you know, technology ever increases, makes things faster. Sometimes it makes it cheaper. Sometimes it makes it more expensive, you know, but in the end, I think we're, we are all motivated by dealing with 50 billion, I think is the number of federal funds that go to universities, sifting through $50 billion of federally funded research, doing our best to find the things that we think are useful and that have a, a potential solution and getting as many shots on goal as possible. So the handful of things get to the market, they actually do get to the market and, and make patients better. So, they, you know, it's a fun discussion and Jamie, thank you for having me and everybody else, thank you. I'm happy to like stay engaged and have this discussion at any, at any point. Um, it's important to the country that, that we improve human health. That's important to the country that, you know, people's lives get better. So I think we're aligned on, on many things, maybe just in the end, the, the tool uh, we don't necessarily agree with, which I think is okay too. So thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I will uh, offer a few a few reflections. I, one, uh, I think it's unfortunate that universities, nonprofit institutions, um, uh, even the private universities like NYU or Stanford or Harvard, they, they they really wouldn't exist without massive public subsidies in terms of the research grants that they get, particularly in this field. And uh, they have done everything they can in this particular field to avoid uh, uh, any obligations they have to protect the public interest and recognize the fact that the US government by investing in the products had rights that could be used to protect the public from aggressive and unreasonable pricing. I don't think that the price for Xandy uh, is a minor thing, my brother is a cancer patient, he has not had extend. He's asked me questions like why his doctor uh, hasn't really put him on the drug at this point. He's a stage four uh, patient. He has had a doctor tell him that it was a very expensive drug. It, there is a consequence of really expensive cancer drugs in terms of formularies. Uh, uh, I, I recognize that innovation is important. My wife's a cancer patient and, and she's been a stage four patient for 13 years and she was given 24 months in 2010 and uh, she's been kept alive because of the continued innovation. Uh, and she's on two, two, she's been on two drug, drug regimes that didn't exist when she was first diagnosed. So I don't really you know, need to, uh, it's, it's not like I needed a, a situation like that close to home to remind me of these issues. We've always thought innovation is really important. 
But the idea that there's absolutely no limit on what you can charge for a drug. I mean, you have to ask yourself, why doesn't, uh, why doesn't Pfizer and, and Estella's charge a million dollars a year for, for, for uh, extend? I mean, what's really holding them back? Uh, because there, there doesn't seem to be a kind of upper limit. The other thing is that the, uh, I think uh, Mark had a hard stop here at three, he had to leave, is that the, uh, uh, the, the Baidu'a coalition, which the universities are, uh, and many of the university institutions, not all of them, are part of uh, with drug companies and investor groups, are not only lobbying uh, against the use of March and, and the Baidu'a Act, but they're now lobbying against the TRIPS waiver in the WTO negotiations, which has to do with really developing country access. And they're lobbying against the use of uh, Medicare uh, uh, pricing provisions in the RRA. They've just kind of basically now decided they're going to be an all-purpose high drug uh, pricing lobby, and uh, and 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 they are they are a group who's 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 uh, uh, among the most important members are are, are public are, are universities, nonprofit institutions. Uh, uh, the, the appeal that's out there for Extandi. Uh, 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 is an effort to try and get the administration to deal with whether or not they think the price of Xtandi is uh, meets this requirement of unreasonable terms. Are there, are there, is it available to the public on reasonable terms or not? And, and, and it's going to be incredibly dishonest and offensive if they continue to get these petitions from cancer patients and say available to the public is the only obligation in the statute since they know that's not part of the statute. There's no really serious debate that that's what the statute uh, 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 you know, uh, says that the statute says, uh, you know, requires that they evaluate these things. And we're just hoping that we get like um, uh, a proper, uh, you know, consideration on the petition that's before them. The other thing is that the, the, the government-wide review of, 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 of is the bigger issue. That I think probably the government-wide review of marching or things is taking place. It's co-chaired with Department of Commerce. And, 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 and the HHS, I think people really have to focus on that and they have to engage in that. They're gonna to talk to stakeholders and stakeholders in this case is gonna mean investors, uh, universities that are right holders and drug companies. And I think to the extent that the public uh, representatives, taxpayers, consumers can have a fairly minor role in this review. And I think it's a pretty scary thing. Um, I'd like to add, uh, 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 thank everyone that participated in this conversation. And I think we'll, we're gonna wind it up right now, but we're gonna continue to work in this issue. And, uh, uh, and, and hopefully we can have some uh, additional conversations down the road. So thanks everybody.